Well, greetings, everybody. This is Chaplain Bob, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The following is going to be part of my book. And, you know, by the time I get done with the doctrinal part of the book, it should be pretty much the equivalent of earning a certificate from a decent Bible college, if there is such a thing. Uh, the way the way the Bible colleges are today, ugh. you know, they're right on. Some things are just right on, spot on, but in other ways, totally messed up. So, yeah, a little bit of truth. And a lot of lies. So, with that in mind, this is going to be part of the book. All right. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to another show of To the Hilt. And I am Hilt, your host in tonight's broadcast. Someone wrote to me as they were told that Trinity is not in the Bible and they wanted me to clarify. Well, by, B-I, is Latin Greek and means two as in bicycle with two wheels. Tri, T-R-I, is Latin Greek and means three as in a tricycle with three wheels. So Trinity, meaning three, is not a Bible word. However, Godhead is. So are the body, soul, and spirit, are they all the same thing? These are questions for a so-called oneness or watchtower devotee, watchtower being the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I mean without any wits. One is people claim only God the Father is God. And they use usually the following texts as proof. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men. The man Christ Jesus. Malachi chapter 2 and verse 10. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Ephesians 4 and verse 5. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. How about Zechariah 14 and 9? And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day shall there be one Lord, and his name one. Isaiah, Isaiah 44 and verse 6. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Huh. The King of the Lord, the King of Israel, has a Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Isn't that interesting? Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first. And I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Now, what is a Redeemer? Let's say you put a lien on your car because you needed some cash and you had a paid off car. And somebody said, well, you know, if you pay me back the money in 30 days, there's no interest on the car. And... We'll, uh, you'll, but if you don't pay it, 
we get to keep your car. But if you do pay it, you're redeeming the car. So basically, you're selling the car if it's not redeemed after 30 days. If that makes sense. So basically, you are buying back what was yours. And that's what basically Christ did with his sheep. He redeemed them from the curse of the law, which is sin and death. But we'll get to that later. However, it's funny how the oneness people always ignore the following verses. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 11, Jesus saying, I am Alpha and Omega. Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. So John was instructed to write what he saw in a book. Also, in Revelation chapter 22 and verse 13, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Hmm. So let us continue. Deuteronomy 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. James 2.19 Thou believest that there is one God? Thou doest wells. The devils also believe and tremble. Hmm. I find it interesting that the people that say all you do all you have to do to, believe, uh, to be saved is just believe in God. Well, if that was true, wouldn't the devil be saved? The devils, they believe in God, absolutely. In the book of Mark, chapter 12 and verse 29, And Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The intention of oneness seems to deny the Godhead or the divinity of Jesus. And yet Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Hmm. So as I mentioned, Trinity is not a Bible word, but God has it. Godhead is. Are the body, soul, and spirit the same thing? Let us look at what the Bible has to say on the matter. Man has a body, a soul, and a spirit. And I always use the King James Bible for my studies. So in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23, we read the following. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, holy as in W-H-O-L-L-Y, uh, as in complete, whole, complete, not uh, holy as in sanctified without sin. No, complete. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says man has a spirit and a soul and a body. Three parts. One person. 
Isaiah 10, 18. And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be as when a standard bearer feigneth. So the body and soul are not the same. They're different. What is a standard bearer? Uh, have you ever seen in the army somebody that carries the flag? Well, that would be like a standard bearer. Sometimes even uh, in the days of old, uh, individual army units would carry their designation. For example, you had the 1st Army, the 3rd Army, the 7th Army. Each one had a different, what they call a standard or an insignia. And they somebody would carry that so that you would know what group to follow, even though they might be side by side in formation. So when a standard bearer would faint, you might get mixed up in the crowd and not know where to go. But the point is, the body and soul are different. In Matthew 10, 28, Jesus said, and fear not them which kill the body. Don't be afraid of those that can just kill your body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And who would that be? That would be God. Destroy both soul and body in hell. Isaiah 26 and verse 9. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. So here in Isaiah, we learn that soul and spirit are different. How about the book of Hebrews, New Testament, chapter 4 and verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Dividing asunder of soul and spirit. The word of God divides the soul and the spirit. Wow. Hmm. Very interesting, if you ask me. Now, in 1 Timothy 3.16, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. This is telling you that God was made flesh. He became flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, or nations, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh, and that meaning Jesus. So the Bible alone teaches man has a body, and a soul, and a spirit. So that means three parts is equal to one man or woman. Yet man was created in the image of God. Huh. So if we were created in the image of God, and man is three parts, but one, and yet one, maybe that would shed some life on, uh, light on Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. 
And God said, let us, plural, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Does that make sense to you now? I mean, it does to me. I mean, not that I understand God, the Godhead, you know, perfectly. No. Verse, Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he, he him. Male and female created he them. Genesis 9, 6. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. So if one man is body, soul, and spirit, which is three parts, and God made man in his image, does that mean the Lord God is three in one? So is Jesus a mere man? Or is he God in the flesh? Or both? In Psalms chapter 2 and verse 7, I will declare the decree the Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son. The Lord is saying, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Wow. So God has a begotten son. A begotten is, you could basically say, of the same essence. The angels were called sons of God, plural, Job 38. And in Luke chapter 3, Adam is called the son of God. Believers in the New Testament, when they're filled with the Holy Spirit, are called sons of God. But only Jesus is called the only begotten Son. Big difference there. And, of course, everybody knows John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. The only begotten Son. If you look at some of the modern Bible versions, it'll say his one and only Son. Well, Adam is called a son of God. The angels are called sons of God. So how could Jesus be the one and only Son when Adam and the angels are also called sons? You see, they take away from the divinity of Jesus in the modern some of the modern versions, which is why I stick with the King James. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Do you believe that? I sure do. So you have God the Son, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost which is God. Now, some will claim that the Holy Spirit or Holy Ghost is not an actual being, but rather just God's power. Well, let us take a look at this from the Bible alone. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, remember that, the Comforter, is the Holy Ghost. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, who, he, who, the Holy Ghost, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I, Jesus, I have said unto you. He shall teach you all things. He shall teach. He being the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. 
For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us which with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he, he that searcheth the hearts, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He that searcheth the hearts, he maketh intercession for the saints. It doesn't sound like mere power, does it? The Holy Spirit is referred to as He. John 16, 13. Howbeit when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of Himself, but whatsoever, whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. Read that again. He will guide you into all truth. He, not an it. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. How can you grieve mere power? Grief is an, is an emotion, people. So how many parts is one God? Three? Father, Son, Holy Ghost? A Godhead? Or a Trinity? I hope this clears things up. And let us now look at the three parts of the Godhead, starting with Jesus. Jesus is God in the flesh the creator of all things, the sinless sacrifice for our sin and our high priest before God the Father. In Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay. How about the book of John, chapter 1.1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word which is Jesus, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Who's Him? Jesus! All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Jesus created the heavens and the earth and all living things, people. In Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. The virgin birth was very important since it signifies it was of God the Father alone, and bypassed the sin nature inherited from the flesh of fallen Adam. Jesus had the same mother and father as Adam. Mary was merely the chosen vessel that carried the Holy Child. Because Mary was born of the same sinful flesh that all of us are. And if Mary, if her body was used as part of the creation of the Holy Child, he would have been inherited the fallen nature of Adam also. I know Catholics will argue that point, but Jesus is called the last Adam, meaning that he had the same mother and father as the first Adam. And we'll go into that. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man, Adam, 
man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. 1 Corinthians 15.45 And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, Jesus, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Romans 5.12 Wherefore, as by one man, speaking of Adam, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. See, in the flesh we've all sinned, which is why the virgin birth is so important, and Mary was the mere vessel to carry Christ. Sin nature via Adam was bypassed in Christ with the virgin birth. Is there a New Testament witness to the virgin birth? Absolutely. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. You see, if you knew Hebrew in Isaiah 7, 14, you would know Emmanuel means God with us. But because the New Testament was written in Greek, it tells you, they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Jesus was God in the flesh, God with us. So why does the sacred name Hebrew Roots crowd insist on using Yeshua, Yeshua or Yahashua or whatever nonsense they come up with for, as a name for Christ? Yeshua does not exist anywhere in the Greek New Testament. Yet they totally ignore Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which is in both the Old Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. Why do they refuse to use something that's in both the Old and the New Testament in Hebrew and Greek? Why? They can never tell you that. Do you know that the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, even said to call his name Jesus in the book of Luke, chapter 1 and verse 26, starting in. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto a city of Galilee named Nazareth. The angel Gabriel was sent from God, verse 27, to a virgin espoused to his man, whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, I want you to point something out real quick here. Mary was a cousin of Elizabeth, who was the mother of John the Baptist. She was of the daughters of Aaron. Aaron and Moses were brothers. And guess what? They were of the tribe of Levi. Joseph was of Judah. Mary was of Levi. Why is that significant? Well, there was 12 tribes. Judah was to be the tribe of the kings. Levi was the tribe of the priests. So in Joseph and Mary, by the flesh, you have the merging of Christ being a king and Christ being a priest. Think about it. So, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, 
and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. What is a salutation? It's a greeting. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. So all these people using Yeshua are basically telling you that your Greek New Testament is wrong. Think about it. Verse 32. Gabriel speaking here. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Remember, Joseph was of Judah and David was the king of Ju uh, Judah for a while there. So why do they use Yeshua, Yahashua or whatever? Maybe the sacred name Hebrew Roots crowd have another Christ. That's what I think. So, how about 1 Timothy 3.16? And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus was the only begotten of the Father. John 1, 14. And the Word, speaking of Jesus, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 3, 16 again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Hebrews 1, 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. This verse right here kills the lie of the Jehovah's Witnesses that tell you that Jesus is really Michael the archangel. Because it says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Now, angels are sons of God, Job 38, but they're not begotten of the same essence as of the Father. John, 1 John, 1 John 4 and verse 9. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him him. John 3.18. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And that name is not Yeshua or Ham Yaha. Uh, Yeshua HaMashiach, or Yahashua. No, that name is Jesus. Maybe they don't want you to know the name. Or even Emmanuel. There's nothing wrong with Emmanuel. Old Testament, New Testament. God with us. 1 Timothy 3.16. Wonderful. Wonderful name. 
In the Old Testament, animal blood sacrifice was used to cover, not wash away, sins. It was only until the true Lamb of God came to reconcile us back unto God the Father that blood will wash away sins. In John chapter 1 of verse 29, the next day John, John the Baptist, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Jesus speaking in Mark chapter 14 and verse 24. And he said unto them, This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. And of course, the Hebrew Roots crowd will say, no, 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 it's not a New Testament. It's a renewed Testament. You see, they want, they're saying God's given us a second chance to renew the Old Covenant. So basically, they're telling you they're, you're going to need to take some animals for blood sacrifice, I guess, to the when they uh, rebuild the temple. I don't think I need that. I got Christ. For this is my blood of the new, not renewed, New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. In John 19, 34, when Jesus was on the cross, we read, But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. 1 Peter chapter 1, and verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish, and without spot. Ephesians 2.13 But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Romans 5 and verse 9 Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We're going to be saved from the wrath of God the Father by the blood of Christ, people. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Wow. Wow. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Colossians 1.14 In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 1 and verse 19. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. 
in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us, cleanseth us from all sin. 1 John 5 and chap, uh, verse, chapter 5 and verse 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Revelation 1 and verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. I don't think I could read that enough, time, enough times. Acts 20 and verse 28. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he, speaking of Christ, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Do you know we're purchased with his blood? Oh, yeah. Hebrews 9, 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 3 and verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Jesus is our high priest before the Lord, God the Father. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus was without sin, yet he was tempted in all things just as same as we were in the flesh. When it was cold out, he was cold. When, he, when it was hot out, it was hot. When he was hungry, he when he had no food, he was hungry. When he had no water, he was thirsty. I'm sure he was tempted in all the same ways we were. And yet, he lived a life without sin. I can't say that. Hebrews 6 and verse 20. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Hmm. Hebrews 4.14 Seeing then that we have an high, a great high priest that passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Hebrews 9.11 But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. In Hebrews chapter 7, starting in verse 1, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, 
first being by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. See, Salem means peace. Verse 3, speaking of Melchizedek, Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, I did a Bible study on Melchizedek, and I believe it was Christ before he took human form, but that's just a guess. Christ is likened to Melchizedek and may well have been Melchizedek. Hebrews 2 and 17. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Christ was made flesh. Wherefore in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. You know what it means to be reconciled? Let's say you and your family had a fight. And then one day you decide to go see them and make peace with them. That would be being reconciled. Revelation 7 and verse 14. And he said it to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And that he, being an angel, by the way, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 12 and 11. And they, the church, and they overcame him, the beast, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Hmm. Revelation 19 and 13. And he, speaking of Jesus, and he was clothed with a vesture, dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 12, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Wow. Revelation 3 and verse 5. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Now, this is be Jesus speaking. Raiment is clothing, people. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Yet in all this, Jesus serves God the Father. In John chapter 10 and verse 27, starting in 27, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear the voice of Jesus? If you do, you're one of his sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, my Father which gave them me, is greater than all. 
My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all. Hmm. Verse 30. I and my Father are one. Jesus says, I and my Father are one. Wow. John 14, 28. Ye have heard how I, speaking of Jesus, ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. For my Father is greater than I. Hmm. Matthew eleven twenty five. 25. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Luke 11 and 13. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Have you asked the heavenly Father to give you the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ? Good idea to ask. John chapter 5 and verse 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he, speaking of Jesus, because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. John 5 and verse 30. I, speaking of Jesus, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he, the Holy Ghost, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. John 15, 26. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. John 14, 28. Ye have heard how I, Jesus, said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If ye loved me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto the Father, for my Father is greater than I. John 15, 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even, if, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. All right, so Jesus said, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. In Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 36, someone asked Jesus, What was the most important commandment? He says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Good question. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. On these two commandments hang all the law 
and the prophets. Of course, the Hebrew roots people, they'll want you to get circumcised and keep the Sabbath and, you know, and they'll say, oh, Paul was a false apostle because he did away with the law. No, it was Christ that did away with the law. It's not the Ten Commandments, it's the Two Commandments. Besides, if you look at the Ten Commandments, they're basically summed up in the Two Commandments. You won't do idol worship if you love the Lord, and you won't kill your neighbor if you love your neighbor, right? So basically, the Ten Commandments can be summed up in the Two Commandments. In John chapter 20 and verse 17, this is speaking of when Jesus was resurrected. He said, I believe to Mary, he said, Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my father, to my father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my father and your father, and to my God and to your God. This was when Jesus was resurrected. So, think about it. And Jesus in the flesh, as an example unto us, worshipped the Father. As an example unto us. And I hope you enjoy this study and that you learn something because there are so many deceivers in the world today unbelievable amount of deceivers in the world today all blessings praise glory and honor in jesus precious name amen